we finished uh, Daniel chapter 9 last week, and as I told you, beginning this week, we're going to take a few weeks to discuss the rapture and its timing. Now, before I get started, first let me say that the elders of Jinx Bible Church do not believe that the timing of the rapture is a theological issue over which Christians should divide. And um, feel free to have conversation with any of the four of us about that, and, um, and we will share our belief in why this is not an issue of division. As a matter of fact, if you've ever perused through the Constitution at Jinx Bible Church, what you're going to find there is that we purposefully left out the timing of the rapture as being a distinctive teaching of this church. And we did that very purposefully. But what we did say there is that we are a church that's distinctively going to be teaching premillennial theology. And we discussed it this way, we wrote it out this way in our constitution under our distinctives that we hold to a premillennial interpretation of eschatology. So as you've heard me teaching through the book of Daniel, you've been getting a premillennial interpretation of eschatology when it was touched on in the book of Daniel. Or any book that I might teach on, it's going to come from a, anything on eschatology will come from a premillennial interpretation viewpoint. Whereby the Lord Jesus Christ will return to earth to establish a literal thousand-year kingdom followed by the last judgment and the eternal state. We deny, therefore, that the end-time events in the book of Revelation have been fulfilled in a partial or complete sense. Hence, we're premillennial. We're still futurist. We're looking for a future fulfillment of the passages that we see in Scripture. But as you, if you were to plow through the Constitution, you're not going to find anything specifically related to the timing of the rapture. Which means that there's probably going to be people in our church and maybe on our staff and perhaps even someday on our elder board that perhaps hold to a different understanding of the timing of the rapture one from the other. And we're completely at peace with this. Which means that we welcome healthy dialogue and exegetical study on the topic within the body of Christ. I've perhaps told you the story before, but it's worth repeating now, that while I was a student at Dallas Theological Seminary, I had the, the privilege, and it was a great privilege, to uh, take a class uh, under uh, Dr. John Walvoord, who was the second president at Dallas Theological Seminary for upwards of maybe 50 years. And if you're familiar with premillennial theology, meaning you've, you're, you're kind of into theology, you read books, etc. Uh, Do, uh, Dr. Dr. John Walvoord is one of the, if not one of the primary, the primary heavy hitter with regard to premillennial theology, as was Dallas Theological Seminary, and still is. And um, I had the privilege of taking Dr. Walvoord's class, and the name of the class was titled, The Rapture Question. And I got to sit under Dr. Walvoord for an entire semester, and we used his book titled The Rapture Question. And you can still get that today on Amazon and other places, and I would encourage you to do so. And we plowed through that book and other books, many other books along the way, and Dr. Walvoord expounded on us, and he was in his 90s at that time. As a matter of fact, the last class that he ever taught at Dallas Theological Seminary, and I was privileged to have been in that class. But one of the things that Dr. Walvoord stated more than once in the course of that semester was that he had friends that disagreed with him on his rapture timing theology, and they were still his friends. As a matter of fact, he said they would joke with each other sometimes, like, well, hey, if, you know, when, if, when the rapture happens, if, if I was wrong and you were right, I'm going to give you a thumbs up, and you can... Or vice versa, you know, you know they, there wasn't going to be any of this nanny nanny, I told you so. Or It was friendly. And we need to understand that under the broad umbrella of premillennial theology, 
we seek to remain friends and to not divide the body of Christ over something that should not divide the body of Christ. I mean, listen, what we all know for a fact is that it's going to happen. There's going to be a rapture of the church. Jesus is coming again. Aren't you glad? Therein we rejoice. And so we study the scriptures, we come to conclusions, but we don't strain over the gnats and then use that as a bully club to start beating people with and dividing congregations. This congregation is going to exclusively be a dispensational, pre-tribulational, pre-millennial, but, or you're not welcome. We, we are not that at all. If you came into Gene's Bible Church thinking perhaps we were that, then you're getting a very clear understanding here today. We are not that church. And I pray that that permeates the way the elders exercise leadership and authority over the body. That we're not lording authority over. And in areas where there needs to be charity, we indeed show charity. Now, perhaps you remember where I left you off last week. We finished Daniel 9 last week, remember? Hooray, we did. And this, and this was the last chart I gave you. Um, I just pulled it over into this sermon to show you by way of review um, where we left off last week. And so when we are finishing Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, what's known as Daniel's 70th week, here we see, we saw that. We got the seven weeks, the 62 weeks, and the one week. Those are 70 weeks. And if you want to kind of get a more uh, per, uh, specific overview of those, you'll need to go back and listen to those sermons. Okay, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to chop my chart in half right about here, and I'm going to give you this portion of it. I'm just going to do that. Ready? There it is right there. See? Right here. All of this information is now on this chart because I'm narrowing in, and I want you to narrow in with me. So here, what we saw last uh, week on, remember the 70th week, we, were on, we finished with Daniel 9, 27. Remember verse 27? And we saw that in 27, at the very beginning of that period, of that last week, that there was an, a, co a firm covenant that was made with the many. And I've articulated how that was made by the Antichrist. And then we also saw that there was, at the middle point, halfway into that, that there was called what's called the abomination of desolation. Okay, So now I'm going to narrow in on this one more time, and I'm going to chop off a little bit more. And it looks like this. Okay? So here we have simply a, a chart that just shows us the 70th week of Daniel, that Daniel 9.27 right here. I've got it. And it's a, it's a seven-year period. And so here again we have the beginning of this week in history that futurists say we, we're approaching. We're not there yet. Um, there's a firm covenant that will be made with the, that the Antichrist, who's going to be the one world leader at that time, makes with the, with the world. And um, that's at the beginning of that. And then at the midpoint, it's what Daniel calls the abomination of desolation. He breaks that covenant, and um, he starts pouring out wrath and persecution. So this is um, the week in which we are hoping to discover uh, the timing of the rapture. Now let me just read Daniel 9.27 for us again and kind of reaffirm and solidify that. So he, that's the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. There's the 70th week of Daniel. But in the middle of the week, see right there? In the middle of this week. So this week is seven years. So in the middle of it, that's three and a half years in, right? So in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and in grain offerings. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even to a complete destruction. So after the abomination desolations at the midpoint, the Antichrist is going to be pouring out... Uh, persecution. It's referred to in the scriptures as the great tribulation. But it's also decreed that his end will come as well, poured out on the one. So it's decreed that there's going to be a complete destruction. That is a decree poured out on the one. That's the Antichrist who makes desolate, and that's what he does here. So God's got all of this from beginning to end, and that's one of the things that Daniel 9, 27 lets 
us know. And we also saw from Matthew, see I added Matthew right here to this fancy chart, right there. I added Matthew 24, 15. We also see from Matthew 24, 15 that Jesus teaches on the, sign of his, on the signs of his coming and the timing of his coming. He, too, speaks about this midpoint. Uh, we saw that in Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, which we just read and saw right there, Daniel goes, Jesus makes direct reference to this. When you see that, the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. So again, Jesus affirming the prophecy of Daniel, and that Daniel clearly articulates that the abomination of desolation was when? Midpoint, thank you. Just details matter, you'll, you'll see. Now, a new passage that I'm wanting to add to this to this chart here. See, I added Daniel, I mean, yeah, Daniel 9 and then Matthew 24. A new passage that I want to add to this chart right here is that from the Apostle Paul from 2 Thessalonians, where he also affirms both of these. He affirms Daniel 9, 27, and he affirms Matthew 24, 15. So we're going to add 2 Thess, the Apostle Paul, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, we request, we re request you, brethren, with regard to the coming... With regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him. So here in verse 1, Paul is speaking about the church and about the rapture of the church. With regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's going to be a rapture and our gathering to him. See, he's coming and he's going to gather us. That you not be quickly, verse 2 that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Here Paul is telling the church to not be disturbed by anyone who may be trying to tell them that the rapture has already happened because it didn't. But also notice how Paul assures them of this fact. He says, he says so by connecting the coming of the Lord and our gathering to him, he connects that to what is called the day of the Lord here at the end of verse 2. So, with request to the Lord's coming and our gathering to the rapture, don't be shaken from your composure or disturbed from what we've taught you or from a message or from a letter from anybody to the fact that this day has come. What day? The rapture. And he's connecting it here with the day of the Lord. Keep that in mind. Verse 3. He says there in verse 3, he says, Let no one in any way deceive you. For it, meaning the rapture and the day of the Lord, and notice what he says, for it, again, if we connect it back here to the day of the Lord and the timing and the rapture, it will not come. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction so here Paul is now making these connections with the timing of the rapture the event known as the day of the Lord and without hesitation he's telling the church church don't let anybody deceive you as if that day has already come. Because there's some things that have to happen first. The first thing is there needs to be a great apostasy. A great falling away from the faith. As we saw Jesus teach in Matthew 24 last week or the week before that when we were looking particularly at Matthew 24. That's going to happen first, before the day of the Lord, before the rapture. That's going to happen. And the man of lawlessness is going to be revealed prior to the day of the Lord. Prior to the rapture of the church and the day of the Lord, these two things are going to have to happen first. Now, I'm going to back up here to our little chart. When was the midpoint, the abomination of desolation? 
what we have from the Apostle Paul here is an indication that this Antichrist figure here is, he's calling him here now the man of lawlessness. The son of destruction. And when do we know that happens? Well, we know that the man of lawlessness gets revealed at the midpoint of the seven years, the last seven years of Daniel's 70th year. And then we get a little bit more intel with regard to that abomination of desolation, the one who does this. It's the son of lawlessness, the man of destruction. He says, who, verse 4, opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Here we have the most detailed vision of what the abomination of desolation truly is. It's a man taking his seat in the temple and declaring himself to be God. So here's my little chart. I've added a few little details for you. We've got the Daniel 9, 27. We've got the Matthew 24, 15. And now we've got 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. And now we have more information about what this abomination of desolation that was spoken of by Daniel and made mention by Jesus is the man of lawlessness who takes his seat in the temple of God, makes himself out as being God. And Paul says to the church, Church, don't let anybody deceive you as if that day and that time has already come because it cannot come unless these things happen first. A great apostasy and the man of lawlessness being revealed. And the man of lawlessness revealing happens here at the midpoint. Here's the beginning, Daniel's 70th. Here's three and a half years in. And this is when the man of lawlessness will be revealed now we saw a term in second Thess 2 2 that we need to have a little bit more discussion about surrounding the idea of the rapture question let me go and show you this right here I've highlighted it obviously so you can see it easily it's the phrase right here in verse 2 that's called the day of the Lord and we enter need to understand what the day of the Lord is because the day of the Lord as we saw here in the passage is intricately connected with the coming of the Lord and our gathering to him it's intricately connected to the timing of the rapture that being that of the day of the Lord now with this in mind I want to show you an overview of each of the four views that are under the broad premillennial theology tent with regard to the rapture and its timing. These are things that perhaps you've, you're familiar with and have seen. These are the four views. There may be some others, but if there are others, they have, they're so uh, scantily followed that they don't make the list. Um, so here we have uh, a chart that shows these four views, and the first view that we have right up here on the upper left-hand corner is a pre-tribulational view. This pre-tribulational view is, um, is a view that um, I held, and as I mentioned to you, I held for probably, the, well, all of my days through uh, Denton Bible Church because that's where I first learned it. And then when I went to Dallas Theological Seminary, I was, I was really steeped in a pre-tribulational understanding of the timing of the rapture. And then for the last 20 two years of my ministry, probably 20 of those, I've preached and taught and held to and articulated this pre-trib rapture view. And as I made mention to you last week, I have transitioned away from that view probably over the last year to year and a half. And so one of the things that you're going to be privy to as I walk through this timing of the rapture issue here today is I'm going to let you in on some of the things that helped me in my transitioning from this pre-trib view down to this view down here that I now lean in on, which is a pre-wrath view. 
But, um, as I mentioned earlier, hey, if, if I'm wrong and all my pre-trib friends, which most of my friends are pre-trib, <laughs> and they're right, I'm not going to be upset in the least. I'm just going to say, praise Jesus, hallelujah. Because this entire seven-year period, you see this right here? This entire seven-year period? Beginning of Daniel's 70th week, all the way to the end of it. Here's the midpoint right about here. In the pre-trib view, every bit of that seven-year period is known as the day of the Lord. And this is why it's important to understand what the day of the Lord is. If you notice, if you just spend a little time looking at this, notice how every one of these views, what do they do? The rapture precedes what? The day of the Lord. So in essence, they're all identical except for its timing. All these people that hold all these varying views believe that the rapture happens first, and on that same day, the day of the Lord follows. And you can see that, whether it's a pre-trib view. They just see the entire seven-year period of Daniel's 70th week as the, the entirety of that as the day of the Lord. If you go down to the mid-trib view right here, and I honestly, I don't even know if there are anybody, if there's anybody trying to even articulate the mid-trib view today. There were, there's books that have been written by that, but I haven't come across any of the, uh, any new writings. I don't hear anybody really trying to articulate or ascribe to that unless they're really old. <clears throat> no offense, it's just, it's a view that has kind of fallen out of favor under the premillennial camp. But what it has here, it has the rapture happening at that midpoint. And then following that, the day of the Lord. So these first three and a half years right here of that 70th year period, whatever happens within this, the church goes through it. Pre-trib, the church gets raptured prior to anything that happens in that last seven-year period. Okay? On the post-trib position here, <clears throat> it's post, meaning at the end. Mid means middle, obviously. So you got the rapture at the very end. So here's the beginning. The firm covenant gets signed. Midpoint, abomination of desolation. The man of lawlessness is revealed. They've got the rapture at the very end of this seven-year period. As a matter of fact, the line for the ending of that seven-year period is right here, and they articulate that the day of the Lord is a 24-hour period, a day, it's a day of the Lord, so they take a day as a day, and they will say that a 24-hour period following their, the very end of that 70th week of Daniel, when the rapture happens, there's a 24-hour period of the day of the Lord, and so in essence, what they see is, is Jesus is coming back in the clouds, the church is caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and then they immediately turn around and come right back down with him as he then establishes a, a millennial kingdom rule that would then lead into an eternal state. Okay? And so that's kind of how the post-trib view <coughs> rapture works. Post-tribulation is very closely acquainted with something that's also called historic premillennialism. Pre uh, historic premillennialists are, if there's variances with the post-trib position, there, there are very few, if, if many at all, and so I'm, I'm not going to try to really articulate that. They believe basically that it's at the end just like we have right here in the post-trib view. And a lot of post-trib people, people who hold to post-tribulationalism, will call themselves historic premillennialists. So if you hear somebody and they say, oh, well, I'm historic pre-mill, what they're telling you in essence is that they're post-trib. That's what they're articulating. So those two, in my mind, are essentially the same. There is some debate within historic pre-mill views, and I'm not going to try to articulate that here because that's not a view that I'm going to be subscribing personally or teaching on. And on the pre-wrath view here, <coughs> down at the lower corner, as I mentioned, this is the view that I've transitioned to. And what this view <coughs> sees is, a, is just like all the other views, uh, is that the rapture happens and is followed by the day of the Lord. But you notice right here, there's a question mark. See the question mark? <clears throat> Pre-wrath says that the timing of the rapture is an unknown date. It's a mystery. 
You're not going to be able to calculate it. You can't say, well, hey, the beginning of, we see that that must be the firm covenant that got signed. And so like with pre, with mid, you know, so in three and a half years, like, hey, a covenant got signed with a one world leader. We just start calculating the math. We know when the rapture is going to happen. Or with the post-trib, you can say, hey, we, we, we've affirmed that that's the, the covenant that was signed. And so seven years, we know the rapture is going to happen. The pre-wrath position says that the timing of the rapture is still a mystery. It's that what Jesus referred to, I made mention to you last week in Matthew 24. He says, unless these days got cut short, no person would survive except for the sake of the elect. Those days got cut short. And those days is a reference to the days following the revealing of the man of lawlessness and the persecution that ensues. Those days get cut short by a rapture of the church. And then immediately on the same day, what's going to follow in the pre-wrath view is the day of the Lord. So understanding uh, the day of the Lord and what is the day of the Lord is a very important reality. So I want to just read a few passages for us from the Old Testament that will articulate uh, that concept, the day of the Lord. And the first... It's from Isaiah 13. Oh, I forgot to show you. I, I blew up my little pre-wrath. Yeah, it looked like that. I kind of drew it for you right here, right? If I'd have gone over here, it would have been easier. So the persecution of the Antichrist, it gets cut off. We don't know when. I already talked about that. You like the little people? They escaped. They got, we got raptured. There we are in the clouds. And it will be forever with the Lord. Amen and amen. The dead rise first. We who are alive and remain are caught together with them in the air. And thus we will forever be with the Lord. That's a beautiful truth. So, where's my Isaiah? Thank you. Isaiah 13. Just a little detail, a little intel on the day of the Lord. Isaiah says in chapter 13, beginning in verse 6. Well, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp, and every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will rise like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment, their faces aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel, with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. And just make a little note bene here on verse 10, this is what you might call cosmic disturbances. That word will come into play here in a bit as well. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will not shed its light. Thus, <clears throat> I will punish the world For its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts. In the day of his burning anger. The prophet Isaiah, by way of revelation, is articulating perhaps an already motif because we see the wrath of God is revealed from heaven always against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That's not what's new. But the day of the Lord 
as, a, as an eschatological end time motif is a time that's described like this. A time of the fierce wrath and fury of the Almighty. And we also see Amos articulating regarding the day of the Lord, that eschatological day that will follow the rapture as we saw. He says, Amos says in Amos 5, 18 through 20, Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light, as when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him, or goes home, leans his hand against the wall, and a snake bites him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? These are just a couple of passages from the Old Testament that describe the day of the Lord. And it is indeed a time of great fury where the Lord pours out his wrath on the world. David Rosenthal, a commentator, said this concerning the day of the Lord. He said, it really means the time of God's wrath in an ultimate sense. And as I mentioned, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, Paul said, against all ungodliness, Romans chapter 1, and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. People have been suppressing God's truth for a long time. Those in Sodom and Gomorrah suppressed God's truth. Hellfire and brimstone came from heaven and demolished them. We see all through the course of human history God revealing his wrath against ungodliness. The day of the Lord is an, is an ultimate sense of that because it's going to bring about the end, the end of Daniel's 70th week, the end of this age, the age that we're living in that will lead us into the age yet to come. So in an ultimate sense, this is a time of God's wrath when God will pour out his judgment his vengeance on a wicked world. The Tyndale Bible Dictionary gives some definition. <clears throat> the day of the Lord, expression used by Old Testament prophets to signify a time in which God actively intervenes in history, primarily for judgment. Ultimately, though, the term refers to climactic future Judgment of the world. The final day of the Lord is characterized in the Bible as a day of gloom, darkness, and judgment associated with God's judgment. Associated with God's judgment is language depicting change in nature, especially a darkening of the sun, moon, and stars, cosmic disturbances. Nations will be judged for the rebellion against God's anointed people <clears throat> and king. Which again is ultimately why all four views regarding the placement or timing of the rapture have the rapture preceding immediately <clears throat> the timing of that which is known as the day of the Lord's vengeance against the nations of this world. Because as we learn from the Apostle Paul, we as believers in Jesus Christ will be spared uh, from that day of wrath, which is good news, from that day of the Lord wrath. The Apostle Paul articulates this, and we see this very clearly. I guess I was supposed to slide my slider right there to show you that one more time, that all of them have these intricately linked together, the rapture preceding the day of the Lord. And the Apostle Paul says that this day of the Lord wrath, see, this day of the Lord is a vengeance of wrath that is poured out from heaven against the world, and great judgment will come against the world. So whether it's the entire seven-year period, a 24-hour period, three and a half years, or some unknown disclosed time after the rapture, they all follow the rapture, and it's a time of God's wrath pouring out against the sinners of this world in a very ultimate sense. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. That's the day of the Lord, wrath. And this is why pre 
millennial theology teaches that there will be a rapture of the church prior to the day of the Lord because the day of the Lord is the pouring out of God's wrath directly. The church gets rescued from the wrath of the day of the Lord. We see this also in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. <clears throat> for God has not destined us for wrath, the day of the Lord wrath. He hasn't destined us, church, as believers, for the pouring out of God's wrath on a sinful humanity, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? And in every one of the views, there's an articulation of, this, of these passages right here. That the church is spared from the wrath of God to come. Charles Cooper, another commentator, says this. He said, Scripture explicitly declares that the saints will not experience the eschatological wrath of God. The wrath of God that is typically associate, associated with what we call the day of the Lord. Therefore, the question, in my opinion, really, the only question is, when does the wrath of God begin? Now, as mentioned earlier, <clears throat> pre-tribulationists teach that the entire seven-year period is the wrath of God, the day of the Lord. And that the rapture will occur just before it begins. And they teach that the rapture, the timing of that rapture, is in any moment rapture. It's what's referred to as imminent. It's referred to as the imminency doctrine. And the imminent doctrine <clears throat> simply lets us know that uh, the day of the Lord Thus, the rapture of the church can happen at any moment, like right now, like right this moment. Every single moment we live, moment to moment to moment to moment, any moment, pre-trib theology teaches the rapture could happen, which would then kick off Daniel's 70th week. And that entire period is the day of the Lord. Here's the midpoint right here. That the entire period is the day of the Lord and that the rapture could happen at any moment. And as such, as such, the teaching, the imminent, the imminence doctrine is a really good doctrine to teach the church to always be what? To always be on the edge of your seat with your eyes looking towards the heavens, awaiting at any moment the coming of the Lord. And so, what kind of Christian ought we to be in light of that? Prayed up. Not doing anything stupid, because we sure don't want to be found doing something really stupid when the Lord returns, right? I mean, after all, if he returns in that moment, I don't want to be found doing something dumb and sinning. I want to be found doing something good, like having my quiet time and praying or being a blessing to others, taking care of orphans and widows in their time of need. I want to be doing something good. So it keeps us, it keeps us crisp. It keeps us sharp. Now, you may recall um, it wasn't too long ago that I preached through the book of James here do y'all recall James yes I love James James chapter 5 James is telling those day laborers in the field some of whom are being killed hey you just be patient and you wait on the coming of the Lord because it's near and in that passage I taught the imminent doctrine so back in James when I was preaching James I was still holding to pre-trib eschatology. And I said that James was holding to pre-trib eschatology. See, this, these things impact other portions of, and places of Scripture and how you see them and make interpretation of them. Not this week, but next week, I'm going to dive into the doctrine of eminence. 
and I'm going to basically show you every scripture in the entire New Testament that talks about the eminence doctrine. And we're going to be asking the question, does that really mean at any moment? When we look at every single one of those passages, I've come to the conclusion that it does not mean that. And I've come to that conclusion since I taught you that it was from the book of James. And so hopefully I can be an example to you of what it looks like to be a Berean. How many times have I told you be a Berean? How many times? Almost every time I preach, do I not say, be a Berean and study and make certain the things I'm telling you are so, right? Well, you may not realize it, but I'm doing the same for myself. And it was in that James series, that's when my turn started happening. And when I was studying that passage in James 5, I preached it the way I'd always preached it. But for some reason, I was particularly inquisitive about that, again, because the prof, Howard Hendricks, always told us, when you come to the scriptures, come to the scriptures as if for the first time. Don't read your notes in the margin. You'll get blinded, perhaps, by something you've always believed. So I stopped making notes in my margins in all my Bibles now. You'll never see notes in my margins. Notes... Back when I was in, my, my Bible was marked up from, I mean, I had so many notes. And every time I'd go to the scripture, I'd, I would read it. I'd go to my note. What's, oh, what did, I, what did I believe 15 years ago? How did I hold that? Fit? I stopped doing that. And so like the good prof encouraged me to do when I went through James that time, and, it, and that word, it, the, the nearness, his, his, uh, the, the return of the Lord is near. That's from a Greek word, parousia. And so I... I looked up every passage in the New Testament on the word perusia, and I started perusing them, different use of a similar. I started looking through all of them again, and that started me on a little bit of a journey. And as I always say, you can check with Pastor Matt. You can ask him, because I started peppering him with concepts and ideas almost from th that moment in the book of James. And I never stopped, have I? I mean, I started, I started showing him, well, look at this, and look at that, and look... We, I'm, I'm a Berean of the Word of God because ultimately, church, all that matters is the Word of God. And in the course of this, one of the things that I've discovered is that one of my doctrines that I held to for a long time under greater scrutiny from myself in exegetical work in the Scriptures, one's personal understanding of the Scriptures can change. It doesn't make me a bad Christian just makes me a Berean. I want to know the Word of God. I want to know how to encourage people and shepherd people. Because as I said, the difference on the timing of the rapture does make a, does make a difference. Right? I mean, where's my little chart here? It makes a difference because if the church gets raptured before all this wrath of God gets poured out and we're spared from that as we are, yeah, that makes a difference because somewhere in the middle here, they've got to explain how the abomination of desolation and the persecution of the Antichrist, well, they do. I'll get there, not this week. Those are just, per those are just uh, tribulation saints. These are saints that get saved after the rapture. So I'm going to get to some of that as well. But where you articulate this, it, makes, it does make a difference because what I'm going to be saying, what I'm going to be saying to, to all of us who are alive and, and remain right now, is that um, before, the, before the rapture happens, I don't have an anytime moment rapture now. I'm saying I'm still looking to see when there's going to be a, a, a covenant established with a one world leader that's going to inaugurate the 70th week of Daniel. I'm looking for that. And if I'm alive on this planet and we start seeing the world moving in the direction of a one world leader and there's always been wars and rumors of wars, but then wars start actually happening and I don't know about this Ukrainian-Russian thing, I don't know. I'm not God. I just pay attention to what's going on. But that's what I'm looking for. And if I'm alive on planet Earth when this happens, and I get fairly convinced that that is what that is, then I'm going to have an understanding from Scripture that in three and a half years later, the man of lawlessness is going to get revealed. And, and then when that happens, and we got hooves on the ground, and we see that happen, and you start getting told that you're going to have to take a mark not a vaccine shot this time, a mark on your forehead or on your arm or on your hand. And if you don't take that mark, you're not going to be able to purchase groceries from the store. You're not going to be able to have affordable housing, transportation, etc., etc., because 
What I'm telling you, the scripture teaches that, this, that the Antichrist, he's looking to ferret out believers and then to kill them. That's what he's looking to do. And what I'm saying is that following the, the midpoint, that's what he's going to do. As we saw very explicitly from Daniel chapter 7. said the saints were given into the hand of the little horn, the Antichrist, for time, times, and half a time, for three and a half years. But Jesus said in Matthew 24, lest those days had been cut short. And so what, we're, what we're, I'm teaching is that those days do get cut short. So it matters. So if you're alive and you got hooves on the ground and you see this stuff happening, <clears throat> you may be thinking, well, you know, hey, this is just some unique times. But the, the rapture, it could happen at any moment now. And I guess after this point it, it could. We just don't know when it's going to happen. But it just matters. It, it's important for you to know that you may have to go through some very intense persecution of the Antichrist. We saw in the book of Matthew, we saw in the, in the book, we're going to see, if I get there, no, we're not going to see, in the book of Revelation, both of which articulate there's going to be a great apostasy that's going to come first. That's why I've articulated to you many times going through Daniel, to persevere all the way to the end. If you're threatened with death, understand, it was prophesied and it was determined. Next week, when we get to Revelation chapter 6, I, I thought I was going to actually get there today. Not even close. But next week, when we get to Revelation chapter 6, I'm going to show you explicitly from the sixth seal in Revelation. Well, the fifth seal in Revelation. That those Christian martyrs who are dying during the time of the Antichrist persecution start crying out to God. Not, not the, not the um, tribulation martyrs. The Christian martyrs, the church, because it hasn't been raptured yet. And they're crying out and saying, how long? And he says, not yet, a little bit more. This, this has to happen a little bit more, but then something happens dramatically. It's called the rapture. And then the day of the Lord and the pouring out of God's wrath. And what I'm going to show us next week in particular is the importance of decoupling. Decoupling. The wrath of God that's described as the day of the Lord from the persecution and the great tribulation of the Antichrist. When I was a pre-tribber, I did not decouple those. I saw the persecution of the Antichrist and the day of the Lord as being one and the same. I'm going to give you forensics from the word of God next week that will show you those are not the same. Exegetically, from the scriptures. And then I'm going to say, be a Berean. You need to dig your nose into this, get out your spade, you better start digging. Those two concepts need to be decoupled because they're not one and the same. And the wrath, and this is why it's important. What did we see? 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 What did we're, we're right here? No, nope. where is it? Where is where's my where's my chart? That we're spared from the wrath. There, I went the wrong way. We're rescued from the wrath to come. So the question becomes, what is that? What is that wrath? I've been articulating here to you today. It's the day of the Lord wrath. When I was in pre-trib pre-tribulationalism, -trib -pre this wrath right here was coupled together with the persecution of the Antichrist. It was one and the same, and hence. I held that this entire time here, that the persecution of the Antichrist was really just the wrath of God because God ultimately controls Satan. And since God controls Satan, then the persecution that's coming forth from Satan through his Antichrist is really persecution from God. That's the way I used to articulate it. And it made sense. I squinted my eyes really hard going over several passages, some of which we will get to because I'm going to articulate for you how, how and why I transitioned. But what I've discovered with this pre-wrath view is I don't have to squint anymore. I can look at every single biblical verse as it's stated and it falls in place like a hand that goes into a glove that was made for it. And so when I discovered the pre-wrath view, I was just like, whoa, whoa. And so then I started really digging in. I don't know how many books I've read about the pre-wrath view since then, but I've got a, a library of about 15 of them if you want to borrow one. 
These things are so beautifully woven together in the scriptures. And don't you love God's word? It's a source of truth and life. So if I've piqued your interest, because my bet is that there's probably not any pre-rathers in here at all, except for maybe Pastor Matt. Uh-oh, I let the cat out the bag. He, he ended up transitioning. Uh, we, we, we've walked through this. We shared information with the other elders. Haven't had too many great detailed discussions on it. These are conversations that we have. So my, my, my estimation, I'm probably looking at a bunch of pre-tribulationalists in the room. I know some of you are all millennialists because I've had conversations with you. Some of you are in the preterist camp. Hey, I still love all of you. I just hope you still love me. Are you all okay with me? I think Jesus still is, and that's really what I feel good about. But um, if this hasn't piqued your interest to get you back next week, nothing will. Nothing will. And you need to drag somebody over here because I'm telling you, people need the Lord and people need to know about some of these issues. Amen? So I'm just going to put a mark right about, right about here. Where were we? We got through there. We got right here. We got through Charles. We got through there. Right there was where we're at. We're going to pick up right here. Right here. We're going to pick up right here. Oh, right here. Here we go. I'm going to start showing you next week four primary scriptures that articulate that there are some prophetic events that must take place first. Already, we already showed you two of them from the Apostle Paul. And what were they? Perhaps you remember one was the great apostasy, and second was the revealing of the man of lawlessness. He said to the church, don't be deceived thinking that the day of the Lord and the, ra the rapture's happened because that won't happen. This must happen first. He's already articulated two of these, and they're right here in the middle. So I'm going to show you Malachi 4, 5, and then we're going to really take a deep dive into Joel 2, 31 next week as well. So we're going to pick up right here with these what, what pre-wrath people call precursors, things that must first take place before the day of the Lord. Come back next week. Let's pray.